you see another team trying not to lose. <laughs> They look the same way. They all wear boots. They play. They run around the pitch. But there are two different teams. One is not necessarily interested in winning. He just doesn't want to lose. The other guy doesn't want to lose. He doesn't want to draw. He just wants to win. Now, the formation they will use, the tactics they will employ will be different. One does not necessarily want to win. He just does not want to lose. And what I find in so many leaders, particularly in this part of the world, is that they are not really trying to succeed. They just, they just don't want to fail. And there is a lead, and there's a lead in that. There is a, there is a glass ceiling in that. There is a limit to the extent that you can stretch yourself and pursue the needful when your benchmark is failure. Because for the person who doesn't want to lose, it's not necessarily trying to win. So winning is not his benchmark. His benchmark is failure. So he will do well, he will be satisfied with anything as long as that thing cannot be called failure. So it's not trying to be first. So even if he's 10th in class, it's okay. Even if he's, if he's called 50 in the exam, it's okay. The failure mark is maybe... 39 and below. So if it's cost 40, it's still fine. He will rejoice. He will share a testimony. Right? But the guy who wants to win has winning as his benchmark. They are two different people. And I've come to respect benchmarks and standards a lot. I've come to respect models and templates a lot. Because they are the instruments that power centers use to perpetuate their ideals, right? And if ideas cannot be broken down into um, models and templates and benchmarks and standards and protocols, you really cannot drive that idea across generations. And so, whether onto good, onto good conscience, or onto evil, the critical instrument for perpetuating such thinking basically is through those instruments, standards protocols, benchmark, indices. When you see those things, criteria, you know, those things look so ordinary, but they are very critical. And a lot of times, you have to be able to see beyond the limits of those things. Otherwise, you will be trapped in the script of some people, and you will be loyal within that script. There's something called confident ignorance. The idea that you know nothing, but you are not aware. So you can carry a lot of your foolishness with the class. You can carry with a lot of confidence. Essentially, you are not, you don't know anything, right? But you are not aware of what you don't know. So um, a lot of people are like that. There's confidence, there's ignorant assertiveness. You can assert yourself based on nothing. You know, just because of the deposit of ignorance of those who observe you, you can really feel cool about nothing as something, if you understand what I'm saying. So it comes down to those ideas about standards and you have to be able to stretch yourself beyond the popular standards of your environment to see beyond what everybody is seeing knowing that what everybody is seeing has very little value the majority lack value deep in their solical contents and that is why the few we always rule the many now that's not the choices of the many that is just the order of life because the responsibility and the self-applications that define value are prices that everybody will not be willing to pay or will not be prepared to pay or for some order of life or providence, they are not just able to pay. Am I talking to you? So there are some border lines like foolishness. Foolishness, for example, is a constant. There's nothing you can do about that. Somebody must be foolish, as a matter of fact, for wisdom to continue to have value. You, 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 you can't discount that because s s s people will make those choices. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. What you can do uh, is to work on the strength of your own wisdom. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, some people were complaining about divisions. And Paul was intervening in that concern. And part of what Paul said was that, look, when you come together, I hear that there are divisions among you. And he said, in part, I believe it. 
Then he said the most theologically disrupting statement that in fact there must be divisions among you <laughs> so that those who are approved may be made manifest. So there is a sense in which the unguardedness and wretchedness of the majority is what defines the strength and exceptionalism of a few. And so you can't be perturbed when you see people unguarded. You just want to ask yourself what you want to do with it. Because foolishness is a tool. Without foolishness, you can't define the brackets of wisdom in the world. You really can. So when you are thinking from that perspective, you are transcending popular thinking. Now, as long as you remain within the definitions of what everybody can understand, you will be small. You will be average. Am I talking to you? This is the blessing that we have as children of God. The idea that we can, by the Spirit of God, translate, transcend popular curriculums. Because the source of what we know is not limited to what man can organize. You know, I remember some years ago, I bidded for a job with a bank, and there were many coaches who bidded for that job. It was a coaching contract with some executives. And I have, just think of any coaching certification in the world. I'm sure I have it already, you know. But I put it in my profile, deliberately. I go to those schools not to go and qualify. I go to those schools to learn what they are doing so that I can beat it, right? So I don't, if I put it in my profile, they will claim their glory for who I've become. So I've studied so much in different schools, but I don't put it in my profile, deliberately. Because I want the source of what I carry to go straight to heaven. So um, you don't want to imagine the institutions I've been to, but I've not put them on my profile. Um, so I went to this particular job, and they, they narrowed down the bid to two of us. Two of us. And they asked me, okay, what are your certifications? You know, you know what, what are they? You know, so I told the guy, I, I told the lady, you know, big white lady, I said, look, I don't understand. You know, you are asking for certifications. I said, I, I don't... I don't use those things. I said, how do you mean? We have benchmarks here. I said, but I've shown you track record of people that have coached. You could see the results. People that are millionaires to the governors, politicians, public figures that you can see. You can even call if you want to. That I've worked with over the years. So what do you want? Their lives have been transformed. They have testimonies of my work. What else do you need? Is it not the outcome you want to focus on? I said, yeah, it's the outcome. But in, our, you know, in every organization, as you know, you know, which is true, we have standards for accepting vendors and accepting professionals to come in to train, to coach, or to consult. So you have to meet those standards. So that's why we are asking for these things. I said, well, ma'am, I'm sorry to bust your bubble. I'm not going to, to surrender to that. I'd rather lose the job. I said, but let me ask you a question, ma'am. Say, what is the question? I said, the first person that certified people, who certified him? The first person that certified somebody, who certified him? He said, well, I've not thought about that. I said, you should. You should. You should because the source of knowledge is not academics. Academics is, is a secondary response to, to knowledge. The primary order of knowledge is from the air, so to say. <laughs> that air, you and I know, is the maker of the universe. And so, yesterday, I was teaching these young people that for you to lead in this world, there is a level of authenticity you have to bring into the strength of what you do. Because when you copy people, you will copy their methods. And when you copy methods, you will miss the genius of the original. You will focus on the eccentricity and weakness of the original. That's why some people want to copy Papa Deboe, for example. And what they do to copy him is to wear French suits, is to carry tambourine, is to put their neck out and say, let somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, that's just it. That. But that's not Papa Deboe, man. That's the container that captures who he is. Papa Deboe, who is he? If I'm going to describe him, is someone who saw a jungle and saw a city in the jungle and saw internal revenue for, for both Lagos and Ogun State. 
and so, so much. That kind of person will have been in the Hall of Fame if it was in another country. Because it built an entire city, created income for two state governments, and opened up an entire jungle and became everything. Banks, commercial life, merchant banking, enterprise, everything came there. That is a genius. You want to study how that kind of person is thinking. You, you, you don't want to carry his tambourine because that's not, that's not who he is. That's not who he is. You know, I see people calling their hair, you know, I see people trying to wear white suits because somebody else is wearing white suits. You see people trying to, because there is a research that says that when you copy people, you, will, you have a high propensity to miss their genius and to focus on their eccentricity and weaknesses. And that's what people are doing, fooling themselves that they are copying. If you want to learn how to copy, you have to go to China. <laughs> Those are, for me, the best um, machine for copying things. And they've copied the West so perfectly that they are competing strongly with the West and they remain copies. So if you really want to study the science of copying, you may want to go to the Chinese and perfect that. The only problem with the Chinese, why they will never become a superpower, is that everybody in the world thinks the Chinese is so powerful, except the Chinese man himself. And that is a symposium discussion for another day. All right, but the, the point that I want to make within the short time that we have is to understand that in knowledge and in, in, in creating um, the right benchmarks of knowledge, you have to transcend the limits of right and wrong because right and wrong is a block, because it's a block defined by human experiences. And if you stay within human experiences, you will be trapped within the realm of logic. Because everything human beings go through pretty much exists within the realms of logic. And the things they cannot explain in their logic are the things they assume are spiritual. That is why if you watch the Nollywood movies, when they're writing their script, they write the script to a point where they get trapped. They don't know how to end the movie. You, know, you could see that they are now trapped here. So the only way to end it is to go to a, a high priest who will now show them that this is the problem. So it's a lazy, it's a lazy articulation of value. And that is why they will continue to struggle until they transcend that. But you see, at the other side, when they write movie scripts, they will not come out until they figure out logically how that thing can happen. And that is why they will think about... Um, what was that movie we were watching? Have you seen the movie Inception? Inception? You look at how people enter a dream and sit in people's dreams and install a thought. And you can think that is science fiction. But trust me, anything you see in Hollywood like that is the earliest introduction to the masses about a concentrated research that is ongoing. Okay? So... Let me tell you, it means some people somewhere are hoping and working that that will become a human reality. Have you seen the movie Transformers? And all the different part one, part two, part two of part Transformers. It's pretty much the earliest introduction of the world to two types of technology. One you already know, the other one is ongoing. It's called Cletronics. The other one is nanotechnology. All those machines and them becoming a car and becoming like a human being and robots and doing all of that is basically about nanotechnology and electronics. Now, that is already in our world today. The question is how to make those things cheaper for the whole world to use. The concept of space management is, is like blood to human existence. Because among the four forefathers of production, land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, land does not expand. Labor can increase, entrepreneur can increase, capital can increase, but land is inelastic. It's pretty much fixed. Now, law of diminishing returns. If any of the four factors of production are not increasing proportionately with the other factors of production, what's going to happen? Diminishing returns. So in the world today, there was a time when we were one. Then we were two. Then we became one million. 
People always forget that there was a time in the world where we were just five. We were 10. We became 1 million. 1 million. We became 1 billion. In our lifetime, in our lifetime, if you have seen 10 years four times with some extras like I have done, right, you will have known that um, we were 4 billion. In the 80s, in the 90s, we were 4 billion. How many are we now? In our lifetime, we were 6 billion. I knew when we were 4 billion. I knew when we were 6 billion. Now we are 7 billion plus. Just imagine that this room used to be occupied by this number of people. After a while, this room will be occupied. If you put 200 people here, we'll still be fine. If you make us 1,000 here, we'll still be fine. If you put us 5,000 in this room, we'll begin to struggle. But if you put 25,000 people in this room, we have to decide who is more valuable amongst us so that by ourselves, we can decide who we are going to kill. Because for every human space in that kind of situation, about 20 people will qualify for that space. So we have to find the most intelligent, the most valuable, the most important to the future amongst all the 20 so that we can know who to preserve and who to eliminate. We will become that creative by ourselves. You see, given the right pressure, even in good people, reside potential for evil on a grand scale. Am I talking to you? And so you have to understand that um, people have to get creative in that kind of situation. And what is happening is people are actually getting creative. So part of the challenge is if population continues to grow in China, they've made um, um, the rule that you cannot have more than a child. One family, one child. They did that since the 70s to control their population and justifiably so. Because if they don't, there will be more people than the other three files of production. And there will be a crisis. And so part of the response to that, right, is to manage space. Electronics and nanotechnology will allow us to have five gadgets in one. Six gadgets in one. You can have a car and have a, a television. You can have three cars in one. So that instead of parking three cars in the garage, you can park one car there and you can press a button in the morning and the car becomes a bike and you can press the button in the evening and it becomes a car and you can press another button the next day and it can become a truck the same machine that's what electronics and nanotechnology will do and that is what they are selling to you through transformer the movie am i talking to you so they have to manage space so only you cannot have that that that, that space three spaces to yourself in fact Future space is in the air. Cars are going to park in the air because we are land people. No matter how perplexes all of us, we have weight and we occupy space. So, um, if you park a car here, the space on top of the car is useless. If this guy is sitting here, the space on top of this guy here is useless. You can't come and do anything here. You interfere his own privacy. Interfere with his privacy. Do you understand? So, but we have to use that space because it's a lot of space. So what we have to do is machines like cars, trucks, and things like that, we have to pack them in the air through hydraulic technology. Do you know what I'm saying? That is how the future is going to work. Um, we are going to have to create more and more, I mean, less and less space for matter on land and create more space. And that is why we are organizing to go to Mars and to go to Moon because we know that it's only a matter of time Planet Earth will not be enough for us if the Lord tarries. Am I talking to you? Therefore, when you, when you are in that kind of a place, you are not just taking responsibility for how life is working today. You are taking responsibility for how life will be tomorrow. And that's how God thinks. He declares the end from the beginning. In science, that's called prescience. Prescience. We, we call that the best form of prescience in the kingdom is prophecy. Being able to see into the future, so to say. Some call it foresight, but foresight is a bit different from insight. I will call prescience, it's a bit different from prescience. I will call prescience foresight that is strategic. Strategic foresighting, that's prescience. Prescience 
is, and people who are doing this are not born again, necessarily. I'm a futurist, and it's a skill. So somebody can, using trend watching, trend watching, they can pretty much predict how tomorrow is going to be. Guess what? They'll be so accurate. And I do that every year. Every year, I take people to a room, and I predict what's going to happen the next year. And it's not prophecy yet. By the time I move into the gift of prophecy, it's something else. It's not prophecy yet. It's just, it's just the application of the human mind. Am I talking to you? So, so, so if, if you get that straight, so what, what kind of benchmarks, therefore, how do we see? You see, academics is what you are taught. Education is what to you teach yourself. Revelation is what God teach you. Am, am, I, am I talking to you? Now, academics has not been able to do much in this world. The goal of academics is regulation. Academics is the instrument of order. It's the balance of civilization. So two people can come into this room I explained yesterday. Both of them can put a knife into somebody's tummy. One will wake you up three hours after. The other one cannot wake you up again. What does that tell you? One is a surgeon. The other one is just a killer. Now, when you need your tummy opened, how do you know the one to go and meet? It's academics that allow you to know. Academics say this one is a surgeon. This one is just a knife holder. Now, two guys can argue a lot. Can sit down here and argue with the better team between Barcelona and Real Madrid. Between Ronaldo and Messi. He can argue to any length. He's just a babbler. But someone else can argue and save you in court. Both of them can argue a lot. But where you need to argue a case in court, how do you know they want to go and meet? It's academics that allow you to know that this one is a lawyer, this one is not. Do you get? Two guys can carry a gun. One is a hunter, one is a police officer. So how do you know they want to meet when there's a crisis, a security crisis? It's academics that allow us. So academics is, is regulation in society. Right? But to assume that that is the limit of what is possible to be understood or to be known or to be taught will be a disservice to possibilities. So while academics is valuable and necessary, so necessary that I spent 12 years in the university studying a four-year course. I had to get a degree by all means. Because some people will hear this kind of thing and say, so we don't need academics then. No. Academics is a leveler. It gives you the platform to be believable. But, but you can't embrace academics so much that you forget it's just a face in what is possible. And so academics is a necessary tool to allow you to be recognizable within the system. Academics is what allows the system to recognize you. So somebody can have a natural ability to a natural ability to plan events. You know, and he knows, he's a project management, project manager, naturally. But you don't go and ask for a job, and they say, what's your track record? How can you do this job? You say, well, <laughs> I've been organizing events since year one. You know, and I've done this, I've done that. But somebody else just shows up with a project management certification, and they will respect him more than you, because he has presented what is natural to him in a recognizable format. In a format, the system, so when you know how to organize naturally, and then you go get a project management certification, you have converted a talent to a skill. A skill is not what you call a skill. A skill is what the system can recognize. Talent is what you know it is. Between you and God, you have a talent. But between the system and God, you need a skill. So to get the system to recognize your God-given talent, you have to convert it to a skill so that the system can plug into it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why we go to school. And I tell young people, that's why we go to school. So don't get so determined. But if providence, by some default, or by some error of nature, so to say, you could not go to school, you still have a comfort through education. Don't now let the challenge of education, though, if you don't go to school, don't tell me it's because of school fees. If, if, school, if school fees 
stopped you from going to school, it's not the school fees. It's that you are not creative. You're not a creative person. If you're a creative person, you will go to school. And coming from me, you see, my nickname on campus was, was, was one name. But my nickname, I don't want to mention it so that I don't create, because there are young people here. But my nickname in my family to my mom was Metusela. You know why she called me Metusela? Because she believed I was going to be in school forever. You see, Metusela of Lasso. I mean, 12 years. After 12 years, you should have a BSc, two masters, and one PhD. Am I correct? You don't finish 12 years and have a third class, BSc. Well, that's my story. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's my story. But I live a first class life now. But for me, I had to pay the price by ensuring that against all odds, I get the... Um, I just want to be sure my time is correct because I'm working with time. Okay, great. Okay, great. Oh, this one. Okay, but... Okay, that's what is left for me. Okay, I'm getting it. Are we all together? So, academics is not enough. For leaders, you have to recognize what I'm talking about now. Because if you limit yourself to what academics can provide, you will be trapped within human narratives. And there are extensions there are possibilities beyond what human beings can articulate. So you have to transcend academics and go to education. Now, while academics is what you are taught, education is what you teach yourself. And people are ruling the world because of education. Thank you, sir. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, these guys did not pass the test of academics. They did not even bother to surrender themselves to it. But they passed a higher test, which is the test of education. Now, what is education? Education is the ability of the human soul to experience its environment, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it, and to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. I'll take it again. Education is the ability of the human soul to experience its environment, yes, but to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it and to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. By that definition, so many people are not educated. Even those with PhD may not be educated. Because essentially, they cannot question their environment and they cannot identify the options that exist in that environment. When a man did not go to school and he says the reason is school fees, it's not true. The real reason is he doesn't know how to dig into his environment to create options to go to school. Now you must understand that options are powerful. Options are very powerful. And I'm going to spend the last 10 minutes, 8 minutes, on digging into how options are powerful. But beyond academics, beyond academics is education. Beyond education is revelation. But I will stay with education. Because I found out that Christians are not even ready for revelation yet. A lot of what we are calling revelation is not revelation. It's just the alertness of your human spirit. It's education. Because without the first two, you really can't come into the thought because it's faithfulness in little that brings more. When you are walking in revelation, go check the scriptures. The things you'll be doing is not buying a car. A car is not a testimony. It's our years in poverty that make us rejoice that we bought a car and come to church to torture people in the name of testimony. Muslims are buying that car. Atheists are buying that car. And they are not robbing. And they are not cheating. Superior customer care, market segmentation, product penetration, and they are making the money again all night long. And you use what to make the same money? 
to buy the same car. Angelic support, prayer of agreement, the gift of faith, the gift of willing, the working of miracles, diverse kind of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prayer of agreement, fasting, prayer, anointing oil, laying on of hands, designing of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, angelic support, just to buy a machine that sinners are buying by activating their thoughts. If somebody uses a finger to lift a chair and you need a tractor to lift it, that's labor loss. That's labor loss. God is not excited, trust me. He's, in fact, he's, he's, he's burdened. And saying, this is a this is waste of resources. Angels are on one spot. Hi! Their, their sword is on the left with cobwebs all over the sword. They've not fought a battle in the last 20 years because you're not fighting any battle. And then you want to buy a car? You don't need Jesus to buy a car. If it's a car you want and that's ready for your gospel, please quit. You don't need Jesus one day to buy a car. Atheists are buying cars and they are not stealing, they are not cheating, they are not corrupt. By the time you bring anointing oil, gift of faith, working of miracles, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost just to buy a car. The indwelling of the, with, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. <laughs> then you want to use all of that to buy a car. By the time you are bringing all of that in here, please, Show us the cure to cancer, please. Show us the cure to HIV. Come on now. Give us the next internet. Show us the next social media. Build the next Microsoft, please. Show us the next level of cloud computing. Lead us into the sixth industrial revolution. Lead us into it. Don't come and tell us that you bought a car. Don't come and tell us that you, you have built a house. What is happening? I, I, I built my house. I told God, by the time I am 40, Lord, let me build a house. Really? People are building houses for free for people. People are setting up non-profits, building houses for people. And that's all you want to do? <laughs> Come on. Are you here? I need to go. <laughs> Do you get me now? You need to shift away from those kind of thinking. God is not interested in them. God is seeing some bigger deals for us as his children. Some bigger ideas for us as his children. And we have to think options because options build the world. In the real power circles is the ability to create options that determine how power rolls. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Maybe in the second service we can, we can touch it. But we need to close. See, who owns Toyota? Mr. Toyota. Who owns Lexus? The same Toyota company. Some people say, I prefer Toyota. I hate Lexus. Well, you are buying from the same company. Options. The, somebody owns Honda. He owns Acura. Acura is classic. This Honda is everybody's car. Anyone you buy, you are buying us. I don't like three crowns. It's too cheap. It's for everybody. I prefer pick milk. It's the same company. Whether you buy three crowns or you buy pick milk, you are buying us. Hello? Some people say, well, Facebook is everybody's game. I've left Facebook. I'm on Instagram now. It's still Mark Zuckerberg. Because real power centers. Somebody say, well, I don't like Go TV. How many channels do they have? DSTV. Go TV, DSTV is the same company collecting your money. Because real power centers don't rent a space in your choice. They arrest your choice and camp in your options. You choose PDP, you choose APC, you have to see the same people. <laughs> That's just how power works. You see, real power is not partisan. Is interest driven. 
And truth, when, when, when power centers used to be ignorant, they try to control human choice. They tell you, we control your choice. We tell you what to do, how to do it, where to do it. But no human being is designed to contain known manipulation. The day you know that you're being manipulated, you're going to rebel. You're going to rebel. You're going to reject it. So we came with slave trade. We found out that you are trying to control us. We rejected it. It became colonialism. Still doing the same thing, controlling human choice. What did we do? We rejected it. It became military government. What did we do? We rejected it. I have one minute more. We rejected it. It became, it became what else? It became um, military governments in, 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 in civilian clothing. Still trying to control choice. We tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. We rejected it again. It became scripted democracy all over Africa. Still controlling human choices. We rejected it again. And we have continued to reject anything that attempts to control human choice. The power centers all over the world, I'm, I'm not sure they met, but somehow they have a consensus that instead of controlling their choice, give them control over their choices. Employ pastors, employ motivational speakers, employ authority figures, employ religious leaders, employ authority figures, parents, family heads, to remind them of their right to choose. Let nobody take your choice. Let nobody control your choice. Die for your choice if necessary. Control your choice. Let nobody buy your votes. Let nobody take your vote. Die than lose your vote. Register. Get PVC. Make sure you die with your PVC. Your PVC is your future. Your PVC is your power to choose. It's your rights and your power. Let nobody control your choice. You control your choice. We take a stake in the options. What is the power of your choice when you have to choose between two fools? We have arrested your choice with the control of the options. So while PVC is powerful, it's useless in the face of party administration. Because party administration gives you what to choose. PVC is only as strong as making a choice. The power centers have left you with choosing. They've camped with the options. And when you camp with the options, you determine what emerges. Then you now feel cool. You see, so your choice is now the new instrument to perpetuate your slavery. Because now you are now confident you are the one making the choice. So they've left you with that because they don't want you to, to start re rejecting it again. So how do we make this thing permanent? Give him control by his choice. Let us leave him with his choice and go and camp with the options. So real power dynamics camp around the options. So when you want to understand what is going on, don't look at what is available. Go to how what is available emerges. So when we are telling Christians to come into politics, you come into politics, there are only three people in the world. When we talk about Christians coming into politics, we talk about the first two people. Those you see all the time, the masses, they are the ones voting. Those you see when they are shown, the governor, the president, the stars, the actor, the movie star, the musician, the CEO. Those are the people you see when they are shown. There is a third group, the people you don't see at all. You see, those you see every time, the masses, they are controlled by those you see when they are shown. But those you see when they are shown are created by those you never see. Oh, uh, let me just tell you, that's also why God is also invisible. It's a power dynamic. Oh. The devil too is invisible. Oh. If what you see is all you see, you are blind. If what you hear is all you hear, honestly, you are deaf. Because the real power is not inside what you are hearing. There's always more to the obvious. This is why, as I close, you can't play with your relationship with the Holy Ghost. Because that, ladies and gentlemen, is your key to seeing with helicopter view. To see from all dimensions what is really going on beyond what is happening. What is happening is the narrative for the majority. What is going on is what the power centers are brewing in the corner. With revelation, you can start from there. Am I talking to you? I can assure you that since 2011, 
till date, Nigeria has not made a choice between two parties. You have continued to make a choice between one party represented by two parties. Punch me all you want. Kick me all you want. I've just told you the truth. There's no two parties in Nigeria. How do you forget the content of a thing and focus on a shell? How do we be in PDP today and move to APC three months after and all of a sudden APC is clean and PDP is dirty? But you forgot the human movement between the two. So am I saying PDP is useless? No. Am I saying APC is better? No. Am I saying APC is useless? No. And PDP is better? No. Am I even saying both of them are useless? No. I'm just saying take a stake in both of them. <laughs> it's not to abandon any. It's to take a stake in both of them. When power works, this is how to see. This is how to see. And we have the blessing of the Holy Spirit to see what the agenda really is. And so whatever you do, guys, no matter what you have time for, have time for a walking, talking relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because that is your advantage for seeing beyond the obvious. We are underdogs. The system has been left to go on for so long. It's like Indomie. Indomie has been left without competition for so long that people don't ask to buy noodles again. They ask to buy Indomie. Indomie has become the new name for noodles. It's like Maggi. Maggi has become the new name for spice. You, you don't know because you are educated. Go to the masses and go and see how, what, people, what people say when they want to buy sauce, when they want to buy spice. They say, I want to buy Maggi. They don't say, I want to buy, no. I want to buy, they say, Maggi. It's when you now give them the thing. You notice that they are going away with something different and they didn't complain because Maggi has gone uncontested for so long it has become the new name for spice. In the same way, we've been beating down for so long, you have no idea how conditioned we are. The chance of escaping that conditioning is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that is a free commodity. You don't have to go to Harvard for it. All you need is your Bible and time with him in that word. When people come to me to say, how do you know that? How are you able to see that? I say, well, I have time for so many things. But above all I have time for, I have the time to sit in the word of God and finish the Bible every year. Last year, I finished it four times. This year, by April, I finished it again. By December, I will have finished it the third time. Three chapters a day, five on Sunday. You finish it every year. Six chapters a day, ten on Sunday. You finish it every six months. 12 a day, 20 on Sunday. You finish it every three months. You finish the Bible once, and let's compare notes. It's not in the recall. Please let me help you guys. When you read the Bible, don't make the mistake of asking yourself, what did I just read? Most likely, you cannot recollect. And once you cannot recollect, the devil will tell you, yeah, you just wasted your time. Yimo. You have just, what are you doing there? When you read the Bible, just take it in. It's not a textbook. It doesn't test your ability to recall. When you read it and you finish reading it, it's going to look like you just wasted your time. You didn't waste your time. The word of God is spirit and it's life. And though you cannot remember logically, mentally, you cannot mentally accent to what you read. But in the day of contradiction, it's going to rise from your insight by itself. Listen. When it rises, it may not even rise as a quote. It may rise as resolve. It may rise as anger. It may rise as determination. But it's going to rise from your inside. It may rise as compassion. It may rise as some emotion. It may rise as love. It may rise as resistance. But it's going to rise. All you need to do is keep putting it there. Keep putting it there. The day you sit in a business meeting, it will rise as a level of intelligence that will see beyond what they are saying. It will rise to bring the right words from your inside. Have time for everything if you can. But just in case you can't have time for everything, which I know you can't, don't miss time 
in God's word. That is your part to seeing and hearing. Let's rise to our feet. Thank you very much. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's make some decisions. Come on. Let's make some decisions this morning. Yeah, I know, but let's make some decisions this morning. See, that's the problem. You have to make a decision on what to do. It's not enough to hear the message. You have to make a decision. We gave everybody one year Bibles. We gave you the audio. We gave you the PDF. Nobody, people have stopped. Can't find 15 minutes in the morning with God. I mean, taught three levels this morning. But we know that it's our source that is most important. And with what is coming against us, not only as a country, but in the economy and in life, in our marriages, in our homes, we need that third source. That ability to rise above every situation and circumstance that we find ourselves. Let's make a decision. I'm going to make time for the word and the spirit. Ironically, next month, our theme is the living word. The living word. That's our theme for the network service. And our theme for the real success seminars is start with why. The living word that liveth and abideth forever. You're not an accident. You're here on purpose. You're here on purpose. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. We'll talk about all these materials in the network service. Make a decision. I think it's Maxwell who said, don't turn what you learn into knowledge. Turn it into action. I see. Now I see. What am I going to do with what I've seen this morning? And those of you who have to leave, we want to take your tithes and your offering now. Or those of you who want to give it now. I'm going to allow for a 10, 15 minute break so that he can freshen up a little bit. And then um, just need to put on the generator so that we can cool the place down a little bit. And then you can quickly go for your coffee break, but it'll only be for 15 minutes. So we can start coming back. But for now, bring out your tithes, bring out your offering. Are you blessed? Are you glad he came? Well, I'm glad he came too. What about you? And so when we ask you to please come and take, come and learn at this people's feet, it's not it's for you, not for us. So bring out your tithes, bring out your offering, lift them up to the Lord.